Okay, all right. Uh, hello and welcome. Uh, thank you for logging on and attending this evening's program. Um, my name is Matt Schumann. I am on the programming team here at Cary Library. Uh, before we begin, please let me know if there are any technical issues that I can try to resolve in the chat, uh, or you can send those to me in the chat rather. Uh, any questions you have can also be sent in the chat. Uh, this program is made possible by the generous donors to the Cary Library Foundation. Uh, I'd like to now introduce Professor Charles H. Stewart, the Kenan Sahin Distinguished Professor of Political Science at MIT, uh, where he has taught since 1985. He researches congressional politics, including committees and origins of partisan politics. Uh, and now, please welcome Charles, Professor Charles. <laughs> um, thanks, Matt, and um, thanks everybody for joining on this blustery evening. Um, and um, it's a um, it's a delight to be um, talking to folks about um, this uh, about this topic. Although um, in some ways I wish it were a different topic. Let me share my screen while uh, give me just a second to share my screen. And um, Matt can let me know if um, if it doesn't look right. So let me. Um, um, well, continuing on, on the topic, um, the, the question is, can the 2020 election be safe? And um, the answer is um, yes. So um, we can all go home now and um, go clean, clean our yards and um, mop up the, the rain outside. Um, well, um, if you're, if you're, if you're I, I hope you're reassured because um, I was um, on an interview this morning um, um, with, on a news program, and I'm usually an optimist about how we, where we are with elections um, these days. And at the end of a 20 minute interview, the interviewer said, um, well, thanks for coming on. You really bummed me out. And I thought I had been upbeat in giving, um, giving news about why I thought actually the US was in a, in, a good, in a good position. But as you'll see, there's a lot of challenges. And I think um, that's really, um, kind of where we are. So what I thought I would talk about um, is, are these topics that are relevant to the upcoming election. I'm, I'm going to be focusing really on kind of the um, election administration side of the election, which is um, my area, one of my area specialties. Matt, when he introduced me, um, emphasized uh, my congressional research, which I do a lot of, and there's a little bit of it here. The, the other thing that I do a lot of at MIT is I study election administration, especially on voting technology and, and election reform. I've been the director of the Caltech MIT, or the co-director of the Caltech MIT Voting Technology Project since right after the 2000 election and the, um, the Florida recount that spurred um, the creation of that, of that topic. So I've been studying um, issues related to voting for, for 20 years. Um, and um, so I'm gonna be talking about um, you know, the current situation with voting and um, I mean, really focusing on voting during COVID, although I'm also happy to talk about myths or disinformation and other things that people might be concerned about. Um, those are areas that um, are not, I'm not as expert on, but I certainly know a lot about from talking to my colleagues. So here are the half dozen topics that I thought I would um, spend my time talking about, and then I would be I would love taking questions or engaging in a discussion. First of all, I want to talk about um, a healthy the Healthy Elections Project that I am co-directing with a colleague of mine out at Stanford University. So I'll, I'll just give you a little bit of, of of advertising for a particular project that I'm working on right now and um, in order to um, alert you to some resources and some information that will be evolving over um, the next several months. Then in the heart of the talk, I thought I would first of all just touch on what we're seeing about interest in the election and um, how that's playing out. Um, talk about the imperative, the big imperative, which is the um, de-densifying polling places and moving to vote by mail, why that's important. And um, um, although that's very important to talk about some of the challenges with that. I'll end up by um, um, giving some comments about how 
the nation is doing in terms of modifying how it votes in time for November. And, um, and maybe this is why I bump people out. I'll, um, I'll end the talk by talking about the things I worry about. Um, 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 because as I said earlier, I think election officials around the country are doing a, um, a pretty good job of responding to the current challenges with voting, but there's still a lot of work to do. And we still have um, three months um, to do much of that work. Although um, actually the very first ballots for November will be mailed out in about six weeks. So the election is basically right around the corner. So let me first of all just talk, talk to you about um, the Healthy Elections Project. And, and this project, which I'm the co also the co-director of, is the Stanford-MIT Healthy Elections Project. My co-director is Nate Persley, who's a um, very prominent um, election law professor at Stanford University. Um, Nate and I started working together about 10 years ago when Nate was the research director for President Obama's Presidential Commission on Election Administration. I like to call it the Good Presidential Election Commission. Um, that was put together to study the problems that um, were associated with the 2012 presidential election, especially the long lines. Nate, Nate was the research director of that, of that um, commission. And I, he brought me on to assemble a team of social scientists, engineers, designers, and others who gave testimony, wrote white papers, and in general helped that commission do its work. And, and Nate and I had a good relationship together, but most importantly, we got to be known as um, um, people who could work in a bar bipartisan way with election officials around the country. And as um, the challenges of the election began to rise and rise and rise, especially with COVID, um, and as the presidential election began to come on the horizon, um, election officials were being faced with a number of challenges. Some of them were being spurred by um, lawsuits that were, were coming their way. And um, Nate and I realized that um, while there are some real concerns out there about um, suppression of the vote, um, preparation to, to vote, at the end of the day, you can't sue yourself into a, um, into a safe and, um, 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 and secure election. You actually need to engage in um, management changes. You need to deal with logistical challenges. You basically need to run an election. And that's the thing that Nate and I are very, I, I think are good at doing. And we develop good relationships with election officials over the years. We've also developed a good relationships with um, a number of academic partners partners in the, non, in the NGO community, and also partners among retired election officials. And so the Healthy Elections Project has grown into an umbrella that is um, focused at Stanford and MIT, where we have teams of students on our two campuses doing research into what's happening in um, the current environment and um, in all the states as they go through primaries. And, um, doing research on, on other topics, for instance, on the supply chain, and how those challenges are affecting how we're gonna be voting in November. So we're doing traditional university work, but we're also um, working to support partners at universities who've developed online tools, management tools, um, consulting skills that are oriented around, um, that are best practices in the field, and we are, working to make sure that those best practices are being disseminated to election officials, um, voting election officials around the country, um, particularly focused on the battleground states. Um, and within the battleground states, um, on the cities of the battleground states, such as Milwaukee, Philadelphia, and the rest. So if you go to this website, and I encourage you to do it, not necessarily during my talk, but maybe after the talk, go to healthyelections.org and you'll, you'll see a lot of information that we are that we are assembling. Um, this is dynamic. There's updates every day. We have um, a large number of state updates. You can read about what our students have discovered. Um, Nate's law students, my PhD students in political science here at MIT and Harvard, what, what they are discovering um, as the states go through their primaries. 
um, and we are writing about how prepared they are, what the challenges are in the various states. Um, you can go pick your favorite state. My favorite state, because I grew up there, is Florida. So you can read about the election challenges there, how the primary went there, issues of voter registration in Florida, issues of, of early voting and mail voting, um, and, and, and the like. Um, we have resource guides for election officials and for the public about how about voting by mail, about in-person voting. Um, we have a number of tools that are, that are mostly for election administrators, but I think for the public, it's useful to see what's available to election administrators. And um, there may be a few election people involved in um, working the polls, um, knowledgeable elect about election administration. I encourage you especially to, to look at these tools carefully. Um, but um, it, they're for everybody to look at. Um, there are tools about managing mail balloting systems, designing healthy in-person voting, um, communicating with voters, gathering data and doing data analysis. So there's an, a number of tools and there's commentary and other analysis on the site. So um, I'm not gonna say really much more about that site now other than just to note that I have been basically spending my life um, since the end of March working on this project, um, um, not only um, helping to lead the, the team, but um, talking to election officials, talking to people who might be donors. Um, I hate to say it, but one of, the, one of the ways in which we are going to meet the challenge of voting during the pandemic is through private philanthropy. And there are people out there who have given uh, millions of dollars to help some of these states and, and um, cities by PPE and by um, voting, I mean, by voting equipment. And um, I, you know, this, sometimes I call this um, election administration, a big sale for democracy. Um, but um, that's kind of how we are if Congress isn't appropriating the millions of dollars necessary um, to make the changes that are needed, um, private philanthropy is needed. And so I've been talking to people who might, might, might give and um, in addition to my scholarship and working with our partners. So there's, um, so what I'm gonna talk about draws from my research, from my talking to election officials, talking to other people who are working in this area. So um, to, to jump into the meat of the talk, the first thing I just want to remind us all of is that there is tremendous interest in this upcoming election. So before we talk about the challenges, just remind us that, that there's um, a lot of interest. And one of the ways that I measure this is just with turnout. This is a graph that shows the percentage of um, turnout levels in the United States in presidential elections. That's the blue chart. And um, the orange line shows midterm elections back to the founding up to um, 2018. The very last data point is 2018. And you see the numbers jumping around. I mean, you see that basically since the 1920s, turnout in presidential elections has fluctuated between half and two thirds of all the eligible voters and turnout in midterm elections has fluctuated between 30% and sometimes up to 45%. Um, but one of the things we saw in 2018 was that turnout in the midterm election shot up to a level that has not been seen since 1914. Um, and actually since, um, you know, we're, um, we're, the, we're the hundredth anniversary of women's suffrage. And um, so basically since women um, have had the right to vote nationwide. We have not seen turnout at these levels in the last election in 1980, in, in, I'm sorry, in the 2018 election. So that enthusiasm is carrying over into the presidential election. Um, even if we don't get as big a rise in turnout in 2020 as we saw in 2018, let's just say we get half of that increase um, we're still looking at the possibility of a turnout level that we haven't seen since 1900 in this coming presidential election. And although people may be concerned and worried about turning out to vote amidst um, the pandemic, um, I stand by this um, prediction that people are um, excited, um, anxious, enthusiastic about voting, and we're looking at historic turnout. Here's another um, chart I realize it's hard to to read the numbers are small. By the way, if, if people would like like my slides, I'd be more than happy to share them um, with folks. 
that levels of enthusiasm, if you ask voters if they're enthusiastic about this election, um, the percentage of people who say they're enthusiastic, they've given a lot of thought to this election, is um, at, at ex extraordinarily high levels, um, similar to levels we saw in 2008 when there was a lot of voter engagement. Here's a, um, um, here's, um, a very geeky MIT-like graph uh, meant to illustrate one point, which is that despite the fact that people have been concerned about voting amidst the pandemic, and despite the fact that there are a couple of states that have voted under very dire circumstances in the current primaries, turnout in the presidential primaries on the Democratic side has been up over, over 2016. Um, turnout's been down on the Republican side, but we can attribute that to the fact that, you know, we know who the nominee on that side has been. But Democratic turnout has been on a par with 2016, even after it was known that, um, that Joe Biden would be the nominee. So I take that as a good sign also, that there's a great deal of interest in this election. And if there's a great deal of interest in this election, then we need to figure out how people can vote safely in this election. And so this gets to the imperative that I was, I was mentioning. And the imperative in this election is to de-densify. Um, there's that word that many people don't like, um, but reduce the density in um, in in-person polling places, much like we've reduced the density in stores, in um, everything else we do um, in, in our lives these days. We need to get people out of polling places. We can't have as many people in them despite the fact that there's going to be high demand for voting in November. And the way we de-densify, reduce density, is through two things. First, we have to move people away from in-person voting. That means we need to move more people into voting by mail. And the second thing we need to do is we need to decrease the capacity of in-person voting po polling places while maintaining as many polling places as possible. Okay. Um, now, the second one, second point that I mentioned has not garnered as much attention as the first point. There's been a lot of attention on mail balloting, in part because President Trump won't let us forget that there's a lot of mail balloting and won't let us forget that he doesn't like there's going to be a lot of mail balloting. But um, both Nate personally and I believe in healthy elections that there's actually been an overcorrection in favor of mail voting. And we haven't paid as much attention as we should to polling place voting. And there are many reasons why we need to pay, pay, continue to pay attention to polling place, places. First of all, many people need to vote in person. Many of these people have, are people with, with physical handicaps and disabilities where assistance is called for, is needed, language assistance in many places. Um, we've seen there are problems, that many people are having problems getting mail ballots. Having a place you can go to vote is a, is a fail-safe way to vote if the mail balloting system doesn't, want to work for you, doesn't work for you. Some people distrust using the mails for a wide variety of reasons. If you decide to vote late, um, you can't use the mails effectively. Um, essentially, and I'll come back to this later on, if you are gonna vote by mail in this election, and um, I assume everybody here is in Massachusetts, um, um, we've gotten our applications to vote um, by mail. If you want to vote by mail, get that application in now and turn that, um, turn that ballot around quickly. But there will be a lot of people who procrastinate and those people will not be able to get their ballots back in time. And they will need, um, they will need polling places. And even if we reduce, even if we get as many people as we can um, um, to vote by mail, we're still going to need all the polling places we currently have because those polling places, and you know, if you've been voting in person, the capacity of that polling place, given CDC guidelines, those polling places are only going to be able to hold about half to one third of the voters they normally handle. Um, and if, um, don't trust me, um, here's the CDC guidance on polling places where the CDC is actually saying we should increase the number of in-person polling places, even if we have more people going to vote by mail. That we should maintain or increase the total number of polling places available on election day. And that we should not increase the number of registered voters who go through 
individual polling places. Okay, so the CDC says that. Um, I have an illustration from my own um, polling place. This is where I vote in Cambridge um, at the Graham and Parks Elementary School. This is this is half of a um, this is half of a gymnasium. The other half of, of the gymnasium has a neighboring precinct voting on that side. But you can see normally my polling place um, has 12 voting booths and fits very comfortably in half of an elementary school gymnasium. Um, you can also see, by the way, um, my neighbor um, who has who also votes in this um, in this polling place, and she has a wonderful time voting in this polling place. Um, well, imagine this polling place. This is the this is the um, ver this is the, the the view from the top about how the polling place is laid out. If I were to take this polling place and redesign it, given CDC guidance about social distancing. This is how the layout is going to look. Now, luckily, we could get all those 12 um, voting booths in that half of the gymnasium. But if the polling place were any larger, we could not. Not only that, but everybody who had been waiting lined up inside now has to line up outside. And that's going to cause issues um, that we can talk about later on. So, so this is an example. My polling place is one with a lot of excess capacity, and we can expand out into all of the space. But if you're in a church basement or some other area that's constrained, then that polling place is not going to be able to handle the crowds it used to. Um, but we're still going to need that polling place because um, some people are going to want to use it. Okay. So there are challenges to doing the two things we need to do, more vote by mail, maintain um, in-person polling places. The first challenge on the mail voting side is that we by and large as a nation lack voter experience using vote by mail. Massachusetts is a good example. Um, um, it's only been very recently that we've had um, an ability to vote by mail early. In fact, the 2016 election was the first time ever. If we look nationwide, this shows the percentage of people who have voted on election day, the, the, the blue line um, by mail, that's the red line, and early in person, that's the gold line, um, going from 1996 to 2016. And you can see that voting by mail has been rising gradually. But in 2016, it was only 20% of Americans voted by mail. Um, and so, and it turns out that half of the people voting by mail um, in 2016 were in only five states, California, Washington, Oregon, um, Utah, and Arizona. And so um, by expanding um, vote by mail, we're bringing it to 80% of the nation that's never voted that way and bring it to, bringing it to about 45 states that have never were, had to um, worry much about vote by mail. We lack capacity. If instead of, like in New York, you only have 5% of, of, your, of your voters voting by mail, you now have 60%. You can't do this manually. You need automation. You need machines like this, the Agilis mail sorter. Um, which cost a quarter million dollars. Um, Boston would probably need three or four of these if it ran a vote by mail system. Um, if Massachusetts were to allow um, um, allow towns to pool their um, th their voting equipment, um, Lexington might go in with Arlington to get one of these. Um, but this is like buying a small fire truck if you're going to be voting by mail. And places like Massachusetts, New York, et cetera, they don't have this equipment. So getting that equipment in time, training on it, getting it manufactured is a challenge. There are restrictive laws in many places. Again, back to New York, we're seeing this right now. New York has a very restrictive um, absentee ballot law. They've allowed more people to vote by mail under the, under the um, um, pandemic, but they haven't changed many of the rules related to um, absentee balloting, which means that New York is doing a lot of things by hand. They're rejecting a lot of ballots. Um, in some places I'm hearing, they're rejecting between 10 and 15% of the mail ballots that have come in from the primary six weeks ago. 
and they still haven't finished counting all the votes. Um, and then um, finally, developing capacity is hard because um, you have in places that have been voting in person forever, um, set ways that have, were set maybe a decade, I mean, sorry, a century ago, and it takes a lot to change management practices. In protecting polling places, I'll just say, we need to protect, we have a pro challenges of people and places. And in particular, people are beginning to abandon um, um, work as poll workers and places that offer up their facilities as poll polling places are pulling out. First responders, firehouses are saying no. Churches are often saying no. Schools in many states are saying no. Um, the probably the best example of this was Milwaukee during the Wisconsin um, primary. This is a map of all of the planned polling places in the city of Milwaukee. That's um, the, the gold area there. And then the white area is suburban Milwaukee in Milwaukee County. Those are the planned polling places. These are the polling places they were able to open. Only five. Because, and, the, and the problem there is that poll workers just refuse to work. Um, I should say, by the way, that 65% um, in 2016, 65% of poll workers are over the age of 60. And so we can understand that under the, in, within the pandemic why um, many poll workers are worried um, um, for their health um, from working. We certainly understand it. Um, and then finally, there's things, um, Purell, PPE, et cetera. These new things that have never had to be bought before need to be bought. And then in general, there's money in management that, that high, that, that's over all of this. And so over the last um, four months, uh, um, election officials around the country have been, been, been struggling um, with, um, with these challenges. So how are we doing? Well, um, there's a couple of views out there. Um, some people say that we're not viewing very well. And certainly um, there are a number of um, news reports of challenges around the country. I'd be more than happy to talk about those challenges and what I understand about things that have happened in Milwaukee, Georgia, New York, wherever there's a bad story, I usually know what was going on there and I'm happy to talk about um, those things. But, you know, there's also um, good stories. I mean, there are instances where um, election officials have already um, met the challenge of voting in person, um, voting by mail. There are other um, instances, as in Milwaukee, where the election officials learned their lesson and have um, buy in, that and that are making good progress toward um, having a safe and secure election in November. So there are um, there are good stories to balance the the troubling stories we read in the news. One of the pieces of good news is I've already already visited this, but I should just note that Americans have figured out how to vote amidst all the trouble that we've had over the last several months. Americans are energized. Um, they're able to go, go to the polls. They may not be going under the safest of circumstances, um, to be fair, but they're figuring out how to vote. Um, and they're also figuring out how to vote by mail. This chart um, shows um, the percentage of people, the blue dots are the percentage of people who voted in 2016 during the primaries voted by mail. And you'll notice that most of this graph, most of the blue dots are down at the bottom part of the graph. You know, in 2016, most states didn't use a whole lot of mail balloting. Um, there are a few states, Arizona, California, for instance, that did have a lot of mail balloting, but by, by and large, states didn't have a whole lot of mail balloting in 2016. These are all the states that voted in the primary up until mid-March. Then the pandemic hit. And this is what the graph looks like afterwards. After the pandemic, the states adapted their voting laws, regulations, and practices, and the voters came along and figured out how to vote by mail. So they have voted, we, have, we as Americans have voted in large numbers, and we have shifted into voting by mail. Now, the primary turnout is only half of what's going to be in November, but this is a good start. By the way, I was also, um, there was um, a, a survey um, released um, over the weekend 
where I can, um, that asked a huge sample of Americans whether um, they plan to vote in person or whether they plan to vote by mail come November. Um, this graph, all these red dots, show for every state, the percentage of people in every state who voted by mail in the presidential election of 2016. The blue dots show what people are saying right now they're planning on doing in November. And throughout the country, regardless of whether election official, I mean rather the, the elected officials, the governors and the state legislatures have facilitated things, voters are saying they're gonna vote by mail. Okay, so, so the people are voting, they are adapting. Election officials, and that is the civil servants who run the elections, are figuring out how to vote in this pandemic. But there, there are some things to worry about, and let me just raise them. The first thing is that um, we are seeing partisanship endangering people. Again, the reason why, um, the reason why we want to de-densify, move people into mail balloting, is for the same reason we're doing similar things in every other walk up um, thing we do in our lives. Um, we want to stop the spread of the pandemic. There is getting to be a partisan division about whether people should vote by mail. This shows up in, uh, this is a recent paper. In fact, I was reading it five minutes before I came on and I, I just put, put this, this graph on the, um, in, in, in the slide deck um, at the last minute. But it shows since 19, from 1996 to very recently, the results of public opinion questions when you have asked people do you support all vote by mail? And up until 2018, Democrats and Republicans split about 40-60, but Democrats and Republicans pretty much were on the same page. Starting in April, it split, such that Democrats are in favor and Republicans are opposed. And the thing that worries me is that we are gonna get a lot of people showing up to vote in person, putting themselves at risk, putting um, poll workers at risk because of political attitudes um, that we didn't used to have. So we have partisanship to worry about. Um, for mail balloting, I worry about voters waiting too late to request ballots or returning them. We're seeing in the primaries um, a spike in the number of ballots that arrive after the deadline for the receipt of mail ballots. And voters not following instructions not signing where you need to sign, not dating where you need to date, um, those sorts of things. So rejection rates are up. Um, states like New York have traditionally really high rejection rates of ballots, just that nobody has ever noticed before. We're beginning to notice now that the number of mail ballots has really taken off. For in-person balloting, I'm worried about poll workers, poll workers, and poll workers because it's really the, the, the decline in poll workers that is um, causing polling places to close. And just on that note, I would encourage you, if you think that you're interested, if you have friends who are interested, um, encourage you to go to the Secretary of State's website and find out information about volunteering to, poll, to, to work the polls. Um, I mean, this is one of the things that, that I'm, I'm really touting a lot these days. Um, Another thing that I'm worried about um, is on election day and afterwards, and that has to do with the count of the, of the vote. Because there are so many new mail ballots that will be um, received this election um, in November, it'll be between 50 and 70% of all ballots that are cast. There are gonna be some jurisdictions that respond by automating, but some will have to do a lot of work by hand and it's gonna take a long time to count these votes. So one, there's gonna be a lot of uncertainty about the election. Um, on the other hand, there, there could be, and, and people are gonna get impatient. Um, the other thing that folks should know about the count after election day, it's for reasons we can talk about later on, I want to get to questions, so, so I'm gonna kind of gonna wrap it up. But there has been something over the last 20 years called the blue shift in the days after election day. As you all know, um, there's a big vote count, like in many places, 90% of the votes are counted on election day. 
but there are votes that come in late that get counted later on. Some states like California give the counties um, six weeks to count ballots. Some places allow votes, um, mail ballots to come in three days after election day, so long as they were postmarked by election day. So the ballots come in late. It turns out that late arriving ballots um, tend to be more democratic than early arriving ballots. And this has created something called a blue shift in the post-election day vote count. And to illustrate this, I show this graph, which compares the percentage of the vote that Hillary Clinton was reported to have in every state the Wednesday morning following the election in 2016, compares her percentage on election day, compared to what the states finally certified after all the mail ballots had been counted, after all the provisional ballots had been counted. And you can see, for instance, in Colorado, her lead over Donald Trump grew by a, one and a half percentage points in that period. In California, it grew by a, a point and a quarter. In Maryland, it grew by three quarters of a percentage point. And so there's gonna be a shift in a democratic direction. We know that already. We know that we have a Republican candidate who's already suspicious about late counted votes. And so we're likely to have a great deal of controversy um, after the election. I'll wrap up here and I'd be glad to take questions and engage in a discussion. There's a couple of things I'm not actually not, not too worried about that we've been reading about a lot these days. The first is President Trump calling off the election. Um, and actually I've been talking about this now for the last three or four months. And then um, President Trump may help me out like last week by um, suggesting that he might. And um, the response was the one that I had hoped that we would see, which is um, his Republican colleague saying, no, we're gonna have an election. We're not gonna, we're not gonna postpone. Um, and so everyone's been flushed out. So I'm not worried about Donald Trump calling off the election. I never was, but, I'm, I'm, um, but I hope other people believe me now. I also, I'm not worried about Donald Trump closing the postal service and cutting off mail ballots. Um, um, I am worried, I'm all, and, and part of this is that I'm all, I was already worried about the Postal Service. Um, service has degraded um, at the Postal Service, and it takes a long time to deliver um, mail. Donald Trump might be able to, through his appointees, might be able to slow walk um, the ballots, but I think the problems with mail balloting would be there um, even without Donald Trump. Um, and so, um, in any case, we should maybe worry about mail ballots, but we shouldn't be worried about um, the president closing on the, the, um, on the Postal Service. So with that, um, um, I, I will end my talk and just, um, just reiterate by saying, I think we can, we can safely vote on election day. Um, we can vote by mail. Um, there are risks with that, but there's risks um, in voting in person. We can vote in person, and I hope in Massachusetts we'll be able to vote um, vote safely. Um, and with that, I will um, stop sharing my screen and take any questions that you all might have. Um, and um, there's a few already in the, uh, the chat. Um, I can read those to you if you want. Or... Sure enough. Um, and one of them is to um, actually put that URL in the chat. And I will actually, I will do that. Um, because it turns out it's not always easy to find stuff on the Secretary of State's website. Um, but that's another story altogether. Um, so for people who want to go to the, and what that links to are the um, city and town clerks, who are the people who are responsible for um, recruiting um, poll workers. It turns out in Massachusetts that you're able to work the polls so long as you're registered someplace in the state, and so you're not con you're not constrained to work in your in your town in your municipality. Um, so, um, and I do know that um, that there are some um, um, municipal clerks in the area who um, love poaching from neighboring towns, and so. Um, if, um, if things are filled up in your in your own town, um, call call the neighboring town. They might be they might need help. So let's see. Um, 
So why, 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 are, um, why are polling places opting out or why are, why are poll workers opting out? I, I touched it on a little bit in my talk, um, but just to, to re reiterate a few things. I, I should say, by the way, that um, um, those sorts of issues vary state by state. Um, and, to, and to give you an example, um, we were talking to an election official in Florida a couple of days ago and um, asking if they were having problems with poll workers. And his response was, well, no, not really. I mean, I mean the, our poll workers are down, but in Florida, we're able to, cons we're able to conscript county employees to, to work the polls. And it turns out there are several states that under their emergency, um, under their emergency statutes, um, um, state governments can actually draft county employees to fulfill um, 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 critical tasks. And Flor in Florida, um, um, voting is a critical task. So Florida doesn't have, apparently, is, does not have the, t the problem with people um, working the polls that they do like in Wisconsin. Um, where um, um, the municipalities don't have don't have that no, that right, um, and then similarly, um, 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 polling places um, about a third of all polling places in America are in schools, and um, there's a couple of issues there. The big one, by it is that a number of school boards around the country are saying, well, you know, if the kid if 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 a school is unsafe for kids to be in then it's gotta be unsafe to vote in. Um, and so there's a lot of back and forth between election departments and, um, and schools around the country on this point. Um, um, Nate, Nate and I have are, are, on, are on record of just encouraging um, state and local governments to make, um, uh, make election day a school holiday. Um, so that you can close the building. If you are concerned about that, and um, I don't begrudge anybody, there are concerns about, uh, you know, about um, um, spreading the spreading disease. And so just close the buildings and make them available only to voters and people in there for voting. Um, and that would be actually a good thing for polling places because presumably you could spread out maybe in the gym and in the cafeteria. Um, you would have more room in the in the hallways. Um, for people to queue up, especially if the weather is bad that day. And so, um, you know, I, I'm hoping. Now, um, firehouses um, and, and first responders, first responders are in general very concerned about, um, um, about um, um, the virus. And so I kind of understand that. And I don't know a workaround for firehouses. My wife works the polls in a firehouse in Cambridge, and they've moved, moved it to a, a church that has a big... Um, um, multi-use um, facilities. So that's what's going with um, poll workers. Um, oh, it also turns out the pay is really crummy. Um, um, I was talking to another set of uh, election officials today, and um, it was reported in um, um, that in Milwaukee, that had nobody show up, right? They had to close all these polling places. The um, the state just very recently, like in the last couple of days, surveyed all of the municipal um, clerks in, in, in Wisconsin to ask whether um, Wisconsin um, cities and towns are having problems. They have a primary next week. And the word came back from most municipalities that Wisconsin is short about a thousand poll workers, but Milwaukee is not. Madison is not. Why not? Well, they raised pay from $250 to something like $350. And they have a waiting list now of people to work the polls. So part of it is just raising the pay. Um, may, or is that, so maybe the pay was just too low for the risk of being, um, um, being borne by people. Um, so we can talk more about poll worker Re re recruitment. Um, are the instructions for filling out ballots too onerous for ordinary people to follow correctly? Um, yes, yes and no. Um, again, it really depends on, on the state. Um, um, 
I will say that, so I've just gotten my absentee ballot application. The absentee ballot application is not all that onerous. Um, and honestly, I don't, I forget in Massachusetts um, what you have to fill out to, to vote by mail. I have to say that whenever I've been vo voting um, recently absentee myself, I've actually been voting absentee in person where the clerk in Cambridge will tell me if I made a mistake. Um, so I'm a bad judge for that. I know, um, I know that there are some states with three really horrible applications and some with, that are really, really good. Um, to give you a couple of examples, in North Carolina, um, I was noticing in the research we were doing in the primary there that um, half, that 5%, that it's something like 5% of the absentee ballots in North Carolina were being rejected um, because of the lack of a signature. I have a friend who's on an election board in um, one of the counties in North Carolina, and I said, what's up? And he wrote back and he said, well, this is, it wasn't, it wasn't the application, but it was actually the certification that goes in the envelope to certify that you are you. In North Carolina, you have to have two witnesses or a notary public. If you get assistance, you have to have the person who assisted you sign. And it is a eight and a half by 11 piece of paper with a lot of legalese, eight point type, and it's not obvious where you, the voter, sign. It's not at all obvious. The voter, there is a box in the middle of this form. There's all sorts of places for people to sign, but the one where the voter is supposed to sign is kind of in the middle and it's hidden. And my friend said, you know, in our county, our election director puts a high, yellow highlighter over that. And um, we have a low rate of signature, of signature, um, um, denials. And I looked it up and it was right. So they had overcome this problem. Mm -hmm. um, there are some counties around the, around the country. Um, I mean, if, you, if, you're, if you're into this sort of thing, which I am, check, you, know, you could check out the, the forms they designed in Escambia County, Florida, which is Pensacola. They have beautiful forms. They have, um, they employed in Escambia County a really great nonprofit called the Center for Civic Design. And you might want to look them up. They have gorgeous um, field guides to designing signage, um, designing ballots, writing instructions that people can follow. And there are many states and many localities that have followed them. I know that, that the city um, Center for Civic Design was involved for instance, in Massachusetts, in um, some of the um, design around the automatic voter registration law that just went into effect this year. So Massachusetts has used some of the civic Center for Civic Design. I don't think it has used it though comprehensively um, from my look um, at, the, uh, at the instructions. Um, ah, well, automating, automation and counting mail ballots reopen us to Russian and other hacking. Um, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, the, the short answer is no. Um, the, the reason being that, um, I mean, there's, I mean, there's a lot of reasons to, um, to say it doesn't open us up for hacking. The, the primary one being that, um, these are not, um, these are not systems that are, um, when they're being used networked to the internet, that's the first thing. But the other thing is just that you need so many details in order to run even one of these machines in a particular jurisdiction that you would, um, this is the way I've put it, in order, to, in order to really hack an election, as with this, like with all this automation, you would almost have to map person by person the entire election administration apparatus and reproduce it in the middle of Siberia. Um, you know, there are 8,000 local election jurisdictions. Um, you would need an expert in each one of those 18,000 jurisdictions in order to understand how each, the ballots were mailed out and all of those um, were laid out in all of those jurisdictions, et cetera. So I'm not so worried about automation and hacking. Um, it seems to me that the biggest concerns around automation um, I'm talking to election officials in my own independent research. Um, 
Um, the biggest concerns around Russian or anybody's hacking are the parts of the um, election system that are adjacent to the internet. Um, and the part that's, that's the most adjacent to the internet is the election night reporting system. And so um, if I were a bad guy, so there's two things I would do if I were a bad guy um, and I were going to be um, trying to hack in or disrupt the election. The first would be that I would try to take over the, the, the computer system that reports the results to the public. Um, in the world of elections, there's actually been one hack where that happened. And it was in Ukraine, Ukraine several years ago where Russians, um, um, Russian hackers actually did get into the system that reported the election results. And um, they actually changed what was about to be reported to the Ukrainian people. Now it was caught just in time, but it has happened. Um, and it's facilitated um, by the fact that those systems are connected to the internet. That's one thing I worry about a lot. The other thing I worry about a lot actually is not necessarily hacking as ransomware. And we have seen in some, we have seen in some, um, um, some counties, um, Atlanta was one of them, where ransomware attacks have um, um, sometimes affected election departments, other times haven't, because election departments are beginning to firewall themselves off from county and municipal um, um, uh, um, um, computer systems. Um, but, if, um, but if there were a ransomware, um, attack, then the danger there, of course, is that you might not have access to poll books. You might not have access to the files that define um, um, the layout for the ballots and those sorts of things. And so if I were a bad guy, I would go and, 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 and do a ransomware attack um, and, and get things that way. These, um, these sorter, um, the, this sorter equipment, um, the worst thing, thing that could happen you know, if Boris and Natasha were out there controlling the sorter equipment, the worst thing they could do is basically shut it down. Because ultimately, all that sorter equipment does is it just pulls the envelopes out of the, out of, it, it pulls the ballots out of the envelope in an automatic way. It shoots, it takes a picture of the envelope and the signature which allows you, um, somebody sitting in, in front of a computer screen to compare that signature with a scan version of the, of the signature on file. If Boris and Natasha have taken over that equipment, you go to hand, hand comparison. So you're back to um, doing things by hand. So there's nothing about this automation that um, can't be audited. And there's nothing about the automation that ultimately can't be backed up by manual process. Um, so it's very different from some of the things that some people have been concerned, concerned about. What percentage of paper um, election systems have paper backup? Um, it's going to be in this coming election now at about a level of about 95%. And um, in 2016, it was more like at 80%, 75 or 80%. Um, and um, the, the states that were um, kind of the problem children in this respect have pretty much all gone to paper systems. We're thinking about Georgia, Louisiana, um, New Jersey. So these are statewide. Now, there continues to be a controversy in some of these states because many of these states have gone to things that are called ballot marking devices. And a ballot marking device is a computer terminal that presents you with the ballot you make the choice, then what, it, what happens though after that is that it, it prints out a piece of paper that is the ballot that you can read, that you can um, reject and get a new one and, and, and mark it over, over again, okay? Um, I'm fine with ballot marking devices myself, but I know that people who are concerned about the lack of paper backup do have problems sometimes with those ballot marking devices. Um, um, but I, but I think, um, and we, I'd be happy to talk more about that. But I do think the, that in, in states like Georgia, where all of their laws and voters have been voting on the computer equipment for 20 years, a ballot marking device does give us this tangible ballot 
Um, and it's the scanned ballot that's the ballot of record. It's the scanned ballot that is what's counted. And in Georgia and many of these states, they're also beginning to do more sophisticated audits, something called risk limiting audits, um, which go back and actually check to make sure that um, the scan matches what the paper said in the first place. So there are other things happening in the states on top of just getting um, paper ballots um, that I think are making, um, making voting more secure. Happy to take other questions if people, um, I think I've hit everybody. If folks think I didn't hit your question, you can either unmute yourself or um, try typing again in the chat. And if not, I will encourage you um, again to go to healthyelections.org, healthyelections.org, and follow the work of my project there. And um, you can also get contact information for me and my colleagues um, through Healthy Elections as well. So um, I think I will turn it back over to Matt if there are no other questions.